Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Before we get into the video, I don't know how noticeable it is going to be on camera, but just in case it is, I wanted to mention if you do see something different about the right side of my face, it is because I have a fever blister. Luckily it is a very small one. It is very minor. Usually I get them like right here and it swells my lip to twice the size. I actually have scars all over my lips from really bad fever blisters. I've been getting them my entire life. Luckily, like I said, this is a very, very minor one. It's probably not even very noticeable, but it does make my glands here swell and sometimes it can make it difficult to talk. So if you do notice that or if you do notice that maybe I'm talking a little bit funny or my smile is crooked, that is why. Unfortunately, fever blisters are just super unsightly and uncomfortable and a little bit embarrassing, but I did want to go ahead and throw that out there in case you thought you were saying something weird. You probably are. Now, enough of that. Let's go ahead and talk about bingeable books. What I mean by bingeable are books that you sit down, you don't want to stop reading, and you can typically fly through within 24 to 48 hours. I was inspired to do this video because of some recent reads that I really flew through and I was not expecting to do so and it got me thinking about all of the other books that I've read that were like that and books that I wanted to recommend to you if you were looking for books that were really fast paced could possibly be palette cleansers or things that you can just fall into have fun with and then move on from. So I actually have quite a few books here to talk about so we're gonna go ahead and jump right in. Now this very first book is actually the first book that I thought about when I made the decision to start this video and that book is The Sundown Motel by Simone St. James. I sat down and flew through this in 24 hours because I could not stop. I had to know what happened. It was so atmospheric and spooky and I just loved the vibes of this entirely. So this book is following our main character Carly and 15 years before Carly was even born, her aunt Vivian in the early 80s mysteriously went missing from the sundown motel where she worked and Carly's mother, Vivian's sister, never got to find out what actually happened. And now Carly's mother has passed away never knowing what happened to her sister and Carly is determined to find out what happened to her aunt. So she actually goes to the sundown down motel and gets basically the same position the overnight shift and she is going to investigate Viv's disappearance. So you're seeing Carly as she's investigating in real time and what happens to her and then you're getting the past timeline. I believe it's 1982 when Viv is working at the Sundown Motel and what happens to her. I don't really want to say more about this book. I think you should really just go in and be along for the ride. It definitely is so atmospheric and creepy. This is perfect for around this time of year when you're wanting all of those spooky vibes. If you have not yet read this, I would highly recommend picking it up, especially during this time of year. So this, like I said, I flew through in 24 hours could not put it down. This was the first book I thought of when I wanted to make this video and I cannot recommend this enough. My next recommendation is definitely probably one that you've heard of because it is a super popular book that has actually been adapted, Big Little Lies by Leanne Moriarty. So when this book opens, it is taking place at a school, there's a function going on and you know that a crime has happened and you obviously know where and when it has happened, but you don't know to whom the crime has happened. You don't know what the crime actually is and you definitely don't know who perpetrated the crime. And so this is told through snippets of the present as like police are going around and interviewing guests at the function might have witnessed the crime and then you're going in the past and you're actually following a group of mothers and all these mothers have one main thing in common in that their kids attend this same elementary school the same kindergarten I believe the main mothers in the story are Madeline Celeste and Jane and you're following them in their own personal lives what they are dealing with and what is going on right up until the events of this school function and then of course everything is revealed at the very end this book a lot of people would possibly classify as chick lit but it is centered around a murder and it is compulsively readable because you don't know what happened you don't know to whom it has happened and so you kind of get swept up in the drama of the entire book both the past drama and the drama that is happening in the present day I thought that the story was very well structured I thought that the plot was super engaging obviously otherwise I wouldn't be recommending in this video characters were absolutely fascinating and so while I would say that this is definitely very character driven because you are closely following these three mothers they are very intriguing characters and you want to follow them you want to know what is going on with their lives you want to be swept up in the drama that is going on so I feel like this is very much a mesh of dramas. It is a murder mystery. It is family drama. It is definitely character driven but also plot driven at the same time. I just feel like once you are into this book and once you know the characters and once you are able to disconnect and lose yourself in it that this can be a very bingeable read especially since you want to know what happened. You want to know what the crime is. You want to know what the motive is. You want to know who did it. You want to know all of those things and you want to know how these mothers are involved with that. But overall I found this to be a very solid bingeable read. Next I have A Solitude of Wolverines by Alice Henderson. This is one of the recent reads that I was talking about earlier that made me really inspired to create this video. This is one of those wintry isolation thrillers where our main character is stuck in a situation where she is basically on her own and she has to survive.
five. So this follows a wildlife biologist named Dr. Alex Carter. She has spent the last several years in Boston. She moved there for a relationship that has now failed. She feels stuck. She's really unhappy. And so when she's given the opportunity to move temporarily to the northern Montana mountains to study wolverines on this nature preserve, she basically jumps at the chance. She's going to be staying there all winter, kind of like in this abandoned resort. And this resort is now housed on nature preserve land. And so she's going to be staying there studying the wolverines. But once she gets there, she very much senses a lot of hostility with the townspeople. The townspeople don't want her there. I believe they have like other plans for the land and so they don't really like that she's up there trying to conserve the land and trying to save the wolverines. And at the same time on the actual nature preserve she starts to notice some very strange and sinister things happening. Kind of brushes it off. She's definitely going to stay and she's going to do her job but when some of these things come to get her it really is a struggle for survival. I love this one. I love the atmosphere. It definitely draws you in and gives you all the vibes that you were hoping for when you are reading a story like this. It is not very long at all. It is only 300 pages so it really keeps you moving. While it's not necessarily action packed throughout the entirety of the story. The plot does keep moving. It doesn't go a long time between different things happening and then towards the very end of the book I would say like the last two hours of the audiobook probably the last hundred or so pages. I was on the edge of my seat. I wanted to know what happened. I didn't want to stop reading. I felt like it was very intense and the stakes were high and I just wanted to push through. I did not want to stop and so that's what I feel makes this a great bingeable read especially now during this time when we are in winter and we are getting into the cold for the atmosphere, for the vibes, for the thrill of it. Definitely recommend A Solitude of Wolverines. So completely switching gears for a little bit, I want to go ahead and talk about The Illuminate Files by Jay Kristoff and Amy Coffin. So this is a young adult sci-fi story and yes, it is a chunky book, but what makes this a unique reading experience, what makes this absolutely bingeable is the fact that it is told 100% in mixed media format. So you've got letters and memos and text messages and things of that nature and it just makes this book fly by. Let me go ahead and show you. So like here's the example of a memo and things like that. It is just so very fun. This is probably one of the best reading experiences I've ever had just because it is so unique. I did read this physically, but I have heard that a lot of people recommend that you read it physically while listening to the audiobook because the audiobook is not only a full cast of characters, but it also has the sound effects and things to go along with it. I of course cannot personally speak to it, but I feel like that would only enhance the reading experience. So this is just such an epic space opera. There is an interstellar war. There is a virus zombie-like outbreak. There is a rogue artificial intelligence system. And of course, there's also even a love story. What more could you possibly ask for in a book? I loved the entirety of this trilogy so much. I actually enjoyed the second book, Gemini, even more than Illuminae, which I didn't think was possible. And then the third book was my least favorite, but it was still a solid read. So I highly recommend this trilogy if you were looking for something fast, fun, engaging, something that will also like get your heart pounding. And even though it is told through this mixed media format, you absolutely love and care about the characters. The characters in these stories are so great. Jay Kristoff and Amy Kaufman's humor is fantastic. I relate to it so much. Jay Kristoff has a very dry and morbid sense of humor, which I love. I am exactly the same way. So I love his writing in general. And I cannot recommend this series enough. It is just a great time, an amazing reading experience. Kind of in the same realm, but adult, you have Blake Crouch. So I have Recursion as well as Dark Matter. Blake Crouch writes these very involved adult science fiction novels that deal with some very complex topics. And even though I feel like the science might go over your head, you're still very easily able to understand it enough to follow the story. You don't have to be a genius to read these books and understand what is actually happening in the story. Although Blake Crouch does throw some complex science at you. Now I have come to determine that Blake Crouch is not necessarily my cup of tea just because I am more of a character driven reader. I really like deep complicated character dynamics. I like following the characters and falling in love with the characters and these are more action based. They are more plot focused. These are the kind of books that you would expect to see be made into a movie and translated from a book onto the screen because you know that it would do very well visually. And those books, even though they're fun in the moment, they don't necessarily stick with me. But despite the fact these were 100% bingeable, they're not terribly long. You could absolutely turn on the audiobook or just sit down and read and fly through these books. They're definitely unique. They cover topics that I've never read about before. Super interesting science fiction topics. Dark Matter, I believe, deals with the concept of parallel worlds, how there could be an unlimited number of yous living different lives in parallel universes all over the place. And then recursion, I believe, deals with something called false memory syndrome, where people are going crazy because they are having memories of things that they didn't actually live through, but they believe that they lived through, but they didn't actually do it. So again, these are super fascinating, fast paced. And I do believe that they are bingeable reads. If you love sci-fi, if you are looking for something like that, and you have never actually read Blake Crouch, I would recommend. Going back to young adult, I do want to go ahead and recommend the A Good Girl's Guide to Murder series by Holly Jackson. This is probably one of the most solid YA mystery 
thriller series that I have ever read. It is so well done. Holly Jackson, I can imagine, is definitely immersed into the true crime sphere because the way that she puts this together was so brilliant. And I think even if you are not normally a YA reader, even you could get a lot of enjoyment out of the story. So this follows our main character, Pippa Fitzemoji. And for her senior project, she kind of wants to go and re-examine a very notorious case that happened in her town five years prior when a senior named Andy Bell was brutally killed and everybody thought it was her boyfriend, Sal Singh. And Sal Singh actually ended up shooting himself. And so they thought it was over, case closed. But Pippa has always thought there was more to it. She knew Sal when she was a child. She didn't think that he could possibly a killer. And so she wants to go back and take a harder look into the case and what happened. And so you're following her as she is reinvestigating what happened. She is also getting the assistance of some people who were close to the case, including Sal's brother and some of the dark twisted secrets that they uncover. Like I said, this was so well done and it is a trilogy. So it does continue in book two and book three. And even though those are following somewhat separate incidents, the events in this book and what happens in this book are the catalyst or have influence over what happened in book two and three. So I would definitely recommend that you read these in order. I don't recommend reading them out of order. I feel like you would be very confused if you try to do that. But like I said, these were well plotted. They were well structured. I was even given quite a little shock at the end of this with the twist and the way that it went. I just thought that this was excellently told. Absolutely bingeable. Very easy to fly through. Very engaging. So that's why I consider this a bingeable read. Next, I want to talk about The Butcher by Jennifer Hillier. So this was actually the very first Jennifer Hillier that I ever read. And it is the book that has made me want to continue with her as an author. I hear a lot of her other books mentioned quite frequently, like her newest release, The Things We Do in the Dark and Jar of Hearts. But I usually don't hear this one talked about. And so because it was my first experience with her and because I absolutely found this bingeable, I wanted to go ahead and talk about it here. So this book follows a few characters. First one is Edward Shank, who in 1985, when I believe he was just a police detective, he shot and killed the man who was thought to be the Beacon Hill Butcher, a serial killer that was terrorizing this Washington state area. And by killing the serial killer, it really boosted his career. He became chief of police, which he remained in for 30 years until he retired. And now 30 years later, Edward is actually preparing to move himself into a retirement home. His wife has passed away. He's pretty much on his own. And he wants to give his Victorian home to his grandson, Matt, who Edward actually kind of helped raise. And so Matt is planning to move into this Victorian home that was his childhood home. But when Matt moves in, he starts to make some renovations to the house. But while doing these renovations, he literally unearths a box of secrets, one that's so gruesome that is going to change his entire life and shake him to his core. And then you're also following a third perspective, Sam, who is actually Matt's girlfriend. She's a true crime writer. And she's actually writing a book that's going to cover the Beacon Hill Butcher case. And this is actually a personal case for Sam because she believes that her mother was actually killed by the Beacon Hill Butcher in 1987, which was two years after the Butcher was killed by Edward Shane. Sam believes that the Butcher is still out there. She believed the wrong man paid the price and she's determined to find out who it was and solve this case once and for all. So you're following these three different perspectives as the truth is revealed and how they all connect. And I was absolutely hooked from the beginning, especially because there's actually in the very first chapter, something that is revealed and it's just boom thrown at you. And I remember I was cleaning my bathroom at the time I was reading this and all of a sudden this happened and I was like, oh damn. And I was in it. I was hooked from the start. I love that Jennifer Hillier just tossed that in right off the bat. There was really no gray area about what was going on. I just thought that was so clever and so engaging. And I liked that she kind of got the shock out of the way. She got the shock out of the way so that you could focus on what was going to happen as you were waiting for these other characters to catch up with you as the reader to what you know. I just loved that so much. Like I said, this is another one that I flew through. If you are already a Jennifer Hillier fan, but you have not yet read this book, you need to. And if you have not yet read Jennifer Hillier and you are looking into an introduction. I thought that this was great. I thought that this was fantastic. Next, I want to talk about The Collective by Alison Galen. I was actually surprised by how much I enjoyed this one and how quickly I plowed through it because I wasn't expecting it to. I never read Alison Galen before. I thought the synopsis of this sounded really interesting, but I wasn't expecting it to grab my attention and just take me on this wild, twisty, murderous ride, which was so great. So this follows our main character, Camille Gardner, and five years prior to the start of the story, she lost her daughter in a horrific way. She believes that the death of her daughter caused by this privileged young man who was never brought to justice. But the authorities and everybody else believes that it was a tragic accident. But Camille never believed that. Camille believes that there was more to it and that somebody is out there w getting away with murder. And then one day she's at an event. I believe if I remember correctly, the event is actually honoring this boy and she kind of loses her mind. She loses her shit. And so that brings public attention onto her because she's like gone viral on the internet, right? And this actually causes the collective to reach out to Camille. And the collective is a group of women who are all very similar to Camille. They have all lost their children in horrifically unjust ways where the perpetrator of the deaths has never been brought to justice. And the collective are there to help bring these people to justice. This was such an excellently told revenge-based psychological thriller. I loved how creative and clever 
the collective was and how you're kind of watching Camille get sucked in even though she's not sure at first she doesn't really know she doesn't know if she wants to be a part of this especially when she truly finds out what the group does but then she goes in and you're just kind of seeing these very complicated ways that these women take their revenge and I loved it so much and I thought that the ending was really well done it was twisty I did not see it coming and I love when that happens I love when one of these books can shock me especially after having read so many in my lifetime so if I've not yet read this book and you love a twisty revenge psychological thriller highly recommend I also want to recommend the legal thrillers written by Steve Cavanaugh so the very first one I have here is the defense this is the very first in his Eddie Flynn series and Eddie Flynn is a defense attorney he spent many years of his life being a con man and then he kind of turned himself around he became a defense lawyer because he realized that he could kind of use his con artistry skills as a defense lawyer and just become a success live a cleaner way of life at the start of the story Eddie has actually given up his defense practice he had something kind of shocking happen to him and he doesn't know if he wants to continue practicing law and so he's down on his luck he's estranged from his wife he doesn't really get to see his daughter he's not really making any money until his daughter is actually kidnapped by the head of the Russian mob I think it is Eddie is basically forced to defend the head of the Russian mob against the crimes for which he is being tried and this was super fast paced this is another one that will keep the pages turning because it's set over I want to say maybe like 36 hours this and the plea which is the second book in the Eddie Flynn series are both like that they don't they both take place in less than 48 hours so it is just non-stop action these are other books that I feel like would translate really well to the screen because they are so action-packed they just keep going and going and going and they don't stop there are a lot of twists and turns and very fantastically clever legal maneuverings in this and that's what makes this really interesting for me because I I love complex legal thrillers. I've always found trials to be an art because it really is about who is more skilled. Is it the prosecutor? Is it the defense? Who knows the law better? Who can tweak it and turn it in the way that they need to to get to the verdict that they want? So it really is just such an art form and I love seeing it played out and Steve Cavanaugh does a brilliant job of doing that on the page. So if you like legal thrillers, I would highly recommend Steve Cavanaugh if you have not already checked him out because these were fantastic and like I said, definitely fast paced. They'll definitely keep the pages turning. As I mentioned, before with Blake Crouch these aren't usually my thing because I like the more slow paced character driven narratives but I was so engaged and invested in the story that I didn't mind it I didn't feel like this was really lacking and I still can remember these clearly to this day and I absolutely plan on continuing with the Eddie Flynn series I don't know how long it goes I think at least books four or five are out at this point and I will probably read any other book by Steve Cavanaugh in the future as well if they are as clever and complex as these ones were another recent read of mine was Every Last Secret by A.R. Torrey this was another one where this was the very first experience that I'd had with this author and it absolutely makes me want to pick up more in the future. I would definitely consider this the definition of a popcorn thriller because it is one that is delicious. It's one that once you start, you really don't want to stop until you've completed the story. You are primarily following two women. You are following Kat Winthrop. She's this very beautiful, enviable woman who is married to William Winthrop, who is this very handsome and successful man. They live in this very affluent neighborhood in the Bay Area of California. They are definitely the envy of everyone. They seem to have this perfect life. And then William hires Dr. Nina Ryder to work for one of his companies and as soon as Kat meets Nina she does not like Nina she doesn't trust Nina she feels threatened by Nina and she kind of wants William to get rid of Nina but William is not going to do that so Nina actually moves into the same neighborhood and Kat is seeing her all the time and these ladies they know that they're not friends this is very much like a frenemy situation where they are only polite and civil to each other because of manners in high society but deep down they really hate each other and this is really a game a back and forth between the two women where Kat has a suspicion that Nina is up to no good and Nina is up to no good and so it is a game of back and forth as Nina Nina is trying to get what she wants and Kat is trying to prevent her from doing so because Nina unlike Kat has not really had a lot of wealth and privilege in her life she had a very hard upbringing and as soon as she graduated from high school she married her high school sweetheart they have been married for the past 20 years somewhat happily and they now live a pretty comfortable upper middle class lifestyle but Nina has always wanted more she wants the lifestyle that Kat lives and she is going to do everything in her power to get it and so like I said this is a game this is a back and forth and you want to keep turning the pages because you want to see what the next move in the game are going to be you want to see what the outcome of the game is who is going to win who is going to lose and what is going to happen as a result so I absolutely highly recommend this this is definitely I would feel a great palette cleanser if you were looking for a fast fun read that's going to keep you entertained that I wouldn't necessarily call it fluff at all but I wouldn't necessarily call it substantial either. It is like right in the middle. It's not necessarily something that takes a lot of brain power, but yet it is still clever. It is still very well woven. And I highly enjoyed my reading experience of this one. This next one is probably not going to be a surprise to anyone. This book has definitely been making the rounds in the online bookish community since it was released. It is definitely the epitome of a bingeable book. And that is In My Dreams, I Hold a Knife by Ashley Winstead, which is a dark academia style story. You're following a group of college kids when they were at this very prestigious Duquette University. You're following them during their time 
time there as well in the present as they are all reuniting for the first time after I believe it was 10 years. Something terrible happened to them while they were in college. One of the members of their group ended up dead. Another one was basically convicted in the court of public opinion, even though there was never really any evidence to suggest that this person actually did it. But this person has lived with that stigma the entirety of their lives. Nobody actually really knows what happens. And so now they're all coming back for this type of, they're all going to be seeing each other for the most part for the first time in several, several years. There is somebody that they are going to run into at the reunion who has really not let go. There's a bunch of stuff that has not been resolved and this person is determined to make sure that it is which is how all of the stuff starts to unravel and so you're really following the unraveling in the present day as the secrets of what happened in the past are uncovered so you have the present timeline which is very linear you know it's it's going from point a to point b to point c but in the past timeline you're actually kind of jumping around between different years so you have them in freshman sophomore junior senior but that is not told linearly you'll have some perspectives from sophomore year and then you might jump back to freshman then you might jump forward to junior or senior or things like that. Again, I enjoyed this one immensely. I thought this was probably one of the best dark academia books that I have read up until this point. I thought it was very well woven. I thought it was cleverly told. I really enjoyed when you actually figure out the who done it and the why they did it. Like I said, I really enjoyed the structure of the book. I enjoyed how it was told. I enjoyed how in the present you're following a linear timeline, but in the past you're kind of jumping around and you're trying to piece everything together and you're trying to see if you could figure out yourself who the perpetrator is and perhaps why they did it. So like I said, very well told, definitely a page turner. Highly recommend if you have not already read this. Another book that I don't hear talked about often, if at all, is The Roanoke Girls by Amy Engel. Now this is a very dark and disturbing book, but it is also devourable. And that is why I am including it here because again, it is not very long. You can absolutely fly through this if you can handle the subject matter of the story because it is very dark. This could be classified as like a Southern Gothic tale. You definitely get the vibes while reading this book. I loved this so much. It was what my dark twisty little soul needed. It probably is not going to be for everybody, but I still recommend. This follows our main character, Lane. It is told in the present and the past timelines. In the past timeline, she's just 15 years old and her mother has committed suicide. And so she is actually sent to live on their family's estate in Kansas where her grandparents live, even though she has never met her grandparents and she never even knew her grandparents really existed. Her mother never talked about them. Her mother didn't want to talk about them. And so she has no experience with these grandparents whatsoever. While she's there, she meets her cousin for the first time who has been living with their grandparents for a while. And so she's living this very enviable life. But it really doesn't take long for Lane to realize that things are not what they seem on this estate. There are some dark secrets there. And it is a secret that has caused many other Roanoke girls to try try and flee the estate over time. The present day timeline takes place about a decade later. Lane has escaped Roanoke. She hasn't returned. She has no plans to, but then she gets a call from her grandparents saying that her cousin Allegra has gone missing and she needs to return to help find Allegra. So of course she's going back to the estate. She's going to have to confront all of the darkness that she left behind 10 years ago. I cannot even tell you how quickly I tore through this book, which I would classify easily as a Southern Gothic nightmare. You cannot help but be sucked into this book for better or for worse. It is definitely full of deeply flawed characters that you don't necessarily like and you don't necessarily root for. And even though this tale was definitely warped, it was beautifully and enchantingly told and I just ate it up. And so that's why I wanted to go ahead and recommend it here. If you've never heard of the story, again, I don't ever hear it talked about on booktube. I highly enjoyed this and I'm looking forward to reading more from Amy Engel. I have read one other book by her, which wasn't as good, but it was still pretty dark and twisty. And I'm excited to see what she does in the future because I love this so much. Another one that I picked up that I was definitely not expecting to fly through as quickly as I did was I Found You by Lisa Jewell. I only just discovered Lisa Jewell this year and I've read a few books by hers and I've enjoyed all of them immensely but for some reason this one I picked up and I must have just been really in the mood for it because I tore through it. This is another book that I just absolutely devoured in like about 24 hours and I was just really enjoying my time while reading it. So this is actually told between two perspectives in the present day and then there is a past timeline. In the present day you're following Alice who is a single mom of three and she's out on the beach one day and she notices this man just sitting there not moving not doing anything and he's showing no signs of leaving even in the harshest of weather and she can't stand to see it. So she actually goes to this man and invites him inside her home. And this is kind of the catalyst that puts her in the middle of this mystery that she was not expecting to be a part of because this man actually has no memory of who he is. He doesn't know his name. He doesn't know why he is sitting there on the beach. He doesn't know what has happened to him in the past. And so Alice kind of takes it upon herself to help him figure it out. You're also following Lily, who is very young in this story. She is 21. She is a new bride. She's also a newly minted resident of England. I believe if I remember correctly, she is Russian. So she has just moved to England to be with her new husband and start a new life. But her husband has suddenly gone missing. He is nowhere to be found. He is not answering her calls or texts. She goes to the police and the police, of course, are brushing her off saying that, no, he probably just got bored and up and left. And she's like, no, he wouldn't do that. And eventually they do start to take her seriously. And when they do, and they start their investigation, they realize that her husband is 
is not who he says he is. And so she is confronted with the fact that she is married to a man that she does not even know. And she is determined to get to the truth. So she starts to investigate things on her own. Past timeline is set in 1993 and you're following characters Gray and Christy as they are on a summer vacation in a beach house where they meet this very unusual guy who instantly takes a liking to Chrissy and this puts Gray on edge. He does not trust this guy. He does not want Christy hanging around with her. You're, and of course you're following how all of these timelines are woven together, how they connect, what one has to do with the other. What I like about Lisa Jewell, especially this story, is that I feel like this was both equally plot driven and character driven. I feel like you are given substantial enough time with each character to really get to know them and connect with them. There is quite a lot of plot going on and there's quite a lot of details that you have to keep track of, which is another one of the things that really makes this a fast paced story. I wouldn't necessarily say that the ending has the shock factor that you might want or expect, but I really enjoyed the journey that it takes to get you there, which is really what it's about for me. I don't need a thriller to shock me or astound me. I really want a clever creative journey and I really think that this did that very, very well. I was essentially hooked from the beginning. I was very interested to see how the timelines were woven together. I did not want to stop reading and so I didn't. And like I said, I believe I finished this in definitely less than 48 hours, possibly less than 24 hours because I remember just not wanting to stop. So I recommend, especially if you've never read a Lisa Jewel before, this might be a great place to start. I just found this compulsively readable and I recommend. And then the last book that I want to recommend to you today is one of the best books that I have read so far in the year 2022. This is another book that might not be for everybody, but I definitely have to go ahead and recommend because I found it absolutely bingeable. And that is Razorblade Tears by S.A. Cosby. This was gruesome, gritty, extremely violent. This was a story of vengeance. So in this story, you're following two fathers. One is black, one is white. They are definitely two very different men, but they have two main things in common. The first is that they have both led a life of crime in one way or another. They have both spent their fair share of time in prison. And another is that they both have gay sons and their sons were actually married to each other. Neither of these men accepted their sons. They did not accept that their sons were gay, kind of had an estranged relationship from their sons, even though they loved them very, very much. And when they find out that Derek and Isaiah, their sons have been brutally murdered, these two are going to revert back to their old ways to try to find out who took the lives of their sons. And like I said, this was very, very gruesome. It was very violent. This is absolutely a story of vengeance, but it is so much more than that. It is primarily a story of grief. It is also a story about forgiveness and getting over yourselves and realizing that there is so much more to life than your own self-righteous opinions and that you don't necessarily have to agree with the choices that somebody makes in order to love and care about them. This is also a story about the insane amount of hatred and ignorance that often floods our country. Whether you're prejudiced against race or sexuality or what have you, this book really shines a light on that and it really shines a light on the fact that almost everybody can be prejudiced about something and that we all need to take some time to kind of bring to light our prejudices so that we can work on them and really understand that having so much judgment and hatred stored up is just only contributing to our own darkness and it's eating up our own soul and it's not doing anybody any good. I really liked the poignant commentary. It was done in a very factual manner, not necessarily an emotional one, which I appreciate because I'm a very factual, logical person. I don't really go based on emotion. So I appreciated the way that S.A. Cosby wove that throughout the entirety of the story. He did such a stunning job of taking the story of violent vengeance, which by the way, it was disgustingly satisfying to witness. Like you were rooting for Ike and Buddy Lee to find these people and take them down. Even though you know in the back of your head it's wrong, but this is like a Dexter situation. Like these are very, very bad men who did this to Derek and Isaiah and these men are going to take them out and you want them to do that, which makes you also re-examine like your own soul and what is right. This story just did so much. It was so beautiful and awful at the same time and I loved it immensely and I highly recommend. Like I said, this is not for everybody. Not everybody is going to be able to handle the subject matter in this. A lot of people are not going to be able to handle the language that is in this, but still highly recommend. Like I said, one of my favorite books of the year, Razorblade Tears by S.A. Cosby. All right, y'all, that is it. Those are some of my favorite bingeable reads that I recommend to you if you are in the market for something that is fast paced. It's going to keep the pages turning and you are not going to want to put them down. If you have read any of these books, please comment down below and let me know what you thought. Did you have some of the same opinions as me? Or do you have some other recommendations that you would like to share for bingeable reads? I would love to know. I'm always looking for some. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already, because I would sure love to see you in my next video.